We managed to put together a dual socket 24 core 48 thread system with a new X99 motherboard. And we did it for about $300, $350 or so with some enterprising efforts on the internet. So today we're looking at a 24 core 48 thread system using older parts for cheaper than the cost of a 12 core 24 thread Ryzen 9 3900X, for example, we're going to see how it does today. This is using a motherboard that not only supports two CPUs, but also has onboard video for some added flair to it. The advantages over recent years have diminished for older Xeons that you might find in a junkyard or just online, but it's still one of the most fun ways to build a budget system and hopefully get something out of it. Before that, this video is brought to you by us and our Gamers Nexus wireframe mouse mat. Aside from being the best way to directly support our long form investigative reporting, you can also get a custom made high quality mouse mat made with a high detail 3D design that we created to show off heat sinks, coolers, video cards, and more. The mouse mat uses a stitched blue border for added longevity, a blue rubber underside for unique flair, and a microfiber cloth for smooth tracking. The mat is 36 inches by 12 inches and fits a keyboard and mouse easily. To back order your mouse mat and ensure you get one in the next run, go to store.gamersnexus.net and back order yours while reducing our reliance on advertisers or click the link in the description below. So clearly AMD has made a lot of strides in the last couple of years, specifically though the last year. And some of the strides it's made have unfortunately spelled a bit of doom for some of the used Xeon market. Used Xeons again have traditionally been one of the most popular ways for someone to scrounge together a high core count system for relatively cheap. But again, in light of Ryzen, that story has changed a little bit. Still though, with this new X99 board, we have a refreshed opportunity to get into things. And we're actually using some Intel CPUs that aren't even in Intel's ARC page. It's popular ARC page where it details basically every CPU it's ever made. These aren't in there. We found some engineering samples that are similar to some uh, officially released CPUs to the DIY market, but a lot of the parts that we were working with were OEM only, making them somewhat unique. We've done videos like this in the past, like with the Dual X79 board, with the EVGA SRX that we worked with, and some of the pitfalls of old Xeons can be easily avoided with a modern system, Intel or AMD although AMD tends to be the one in direct competition with old Xeons if you're talking core count strictly. And those pitfalls include things like low clocks on the Xeons, aging architectures, limited instruction sets, and some older examples. Uh, but still, some of the Xeons get really, really cheap. And today, there are more budget motherboards being built to support them. With boards like this, or the one that we bought in SCG eMarket in Huachian Bay in Shenzhen, we showed how a lot of the boards will sort of the new, the new, in air quotes there, X99 or X79 boards will cobble together basically e-waste, where in some instances the chipsets are being stripped out of otherwise broken motherboards and repurposed into new ones. In this sense, the uh, enterprising efforts that are definitely not officially supported by Intel are somewhat admirable because you get extra life out of the component that was otherwise destined for a landfill, but it also means that you get sometimes an extremely eclectic mix of parts that may not really work as you would hope. We experimented with one dual socket motherboard from AliExpress in the past, and that was the Huanenzhi X79, or really it's a C602 model board, that we bought to fit two Xeon E5 2697V2s. We ended up swapping to an RMA at EVGA SRX for that one instead, which created a paradoxical mix of extremely high-end and expensive hardware that was simultaneously obsolete and unimpressive compared to anything modern. It was a fun review, but now we're moving to the other end of the spectrum, where we're looking for hardware that may actually be a good bargain. This all started when we saw a listing for the Jin Sha Xuan Lu X99 motherboard, or if we translate that by the characters anyway, it's basically a powerful shark or, or shark of great power and uh, two-way would be Xuan Lu. So that's what the board is. Powerful Shark might be a play on Sha the, the, for sand, but the character looks to be shark. So 
If you have more opinions on that, let us know. But that's what the board is. That's what we're looking at. It's a new X99 board. And at this point, plenty of other motherboards have surfaced since we bought this one. But the two-way remains one of the most interesting in terms of features. We should point out right away that this board technically uses the Intel C612 chipset. But X99 is a convenient way of describing which CPUs are compatible. So what do we pay then? Well, back in May when this project began, it was one, it took a while to get the board, but two, uh, we put it on hold for a bit. It was $166 for the motherboard at the time. We had to buy two because the first one vanished in the uh, transit somewhere. We don't know where it went. Someone out there got a motherboard that they didn't pay for. And uh, the CPUs, we paid less than $100 per CPU. And in fact, while buying these CPUs, uh, this board, by the way, can support both the V3 or the V4 Xeons, which is beneficial. We found multiple sub $100 options on AliExpress that actually looked kind of like a scam. So we bought one. So the first two CPUs we bought were OEM only, 12 core, they were 24 threads, Xeon 2678V3 CPUs at just shy of $100 a piece. Currently, these are available in the $80 to $100 range. These are Haswell EP CPUs from 2015, clocked to 2.5 gigahertz base and 3.3 boost with a strictly enforced TDP of 120 watts per CPU. This combination of board and CPUs dodged one of the major issues we had in our earlier dual socket testing, in that it's fully compatible with regular non-ECC DDR4 memory, although it can handle ECC as well. That meant that we could use the same memory we always do for CPU testing, and it broadens the range of cheap used memory available to customers. AliExpress sellers frequently offer CPU motherboard and RAM combos for these types of boards, but we were able to get a better deal by looking parts up individually. The third CPU we bought was the weird one. This was an anonymous 14-core, 28-thread engineering sample with the sample specification number QEY6. We bought this for a staggeringly cheap $69, and we'll probably work on it separately. We only bought one because we suspected it was a scam, but we received the CPU exactly as advertised, and it even works, and it has all 14 cores. The seller has since changed the price to $120, but we'll cover the CPU in more detail later. Now, before we get any further explaining the fun of working with this motherboard, we should put some quick benchmarks on the screen. We have a lot more we'll get into later, though. We'll start with a blender run to get a ballpark idea of where it performs compared to, say, a 3900X with 12 cores and 24 threads on its own. And we'll also cover a couple of games, then get into more production and games a little bit later on. This motherboard, though, does technically say gaming right on the box. So even though we'd say it would make a lot more sense as maybe a workstation uh, use case, it claims gaming. We're going to test gaming in addition to the workstation applications. The direct price comparisons for a, a pair of $100-ish Xeons would be something like, well, when we started this piece, the 3600, which was $200 at the time, but not lately. It's now cheaper. Or the i5-10400 at the time. You could also look at something like a core-to-core -core comparison, but everything that's this many cores today is obviously a lot more expensive. Let's start with something that these CPUs might actually be good at, a tile-based rendering workload. The first test is rendering our custom monkey head scene in Blender, a heavy all-core workload that we've defined in multiple years of CPU methodology articles. We have a Turbo Boost tweak applied as well, but we'll talk about that board hack later in this content. The dual Xeons require nine and a half minutes to complete this render when stock, which is close to the performance of a single stock 3900X. The 3900X has half the cores and threads of the combined Xeons, but it's also a 400-ish dollar part and still requires a motherboard, while our 48-thread Schwan Lu system is about $350 with the board included. The dual socket build has good performance compared to the modern price equivalents. The stock 3600, for instance, took 18.3 minutes to render this file, and the 10400 took 22.7 minutes. Cores are cheap with old Xeons. We'll cover the more modern games later, but let's start with Shadow of the Tomb Raider. It's been around for a few years, and it handles high core count CPUs fairly well. The Xeons have a good chance here, but the dual chips managed an average of 119 FPS, which is around the stock performance of the uh, fellow Haswell chip with one sixth the core count, the i7-4790K. That's not breathtaking performance, but the real failures of the dual CPU system are in the terrible, stuttery 1% and 0.1% loads. We've run into the same problem before when testing the 2697v2s in games. In modern terms, the dual Xeons are slightly above the performance of a stock R33100, 
or Intel's own i3-10100, the 135 FPS average of the 10400 with limited memory speed, and the 141 FPS average of the 3600 non-overclocked, are well beyond the performance of the Xeons. But again, the stutters are the real problem with the dual socket system. This game just doesn't know how to cope with it, and latency also becomes a challenge. That may be a non-issue in something like Blender or other workstation tasks, but in this one, it's a problem. AMD's 3900X may have half the total core count of the Schwann Loop, but it's managing 147 FPS average with lows at 106 FPS 1% and 92 FPS 0.1%. The 3900X alone is $50 to $100 more than both of our CPUs and the motherboard combined, but it's also disproportionately better in games. The oldest game in our test suite might be the most appropriate for Haswell CPUs, although as we've noted in the past, GTA 5 draws little benefit from high core counts. Because of this, they managed an average of just 65 FPS, with a 0.1% low average dipping to 20 FPS. Even the modern budget CPUs left the 2678s in the dust in this test, with the 3100 averaging 81 FPS and the 10100 averaging 90 FPS. The 104 and the 3600 averaged 97 FPS and 106 respectively, again with limited memory speed on the i5 and no OC on the R5, and both had better 0.1% lows for the most part across these games. The 3900X still posts 113 FPS average with its 12 cores, so there's clearly room to scale yet, but the architecture and config have to be right. So our expectations are set then. This board is marketed as gaming hardware, but you shouldn't really be buying it for that, even if you're buying used. There are better, older used options if you're in a region where you don't really have access to newer hardware, or maybe it's marked up to ridiculous prices. Dual socket Xeons in this instance, even though it's cheap, and air quotes there, wouldn't necessarily be the best route. Trying to find something else that's single socket would really simplify things for you and eliminate a lot of the stuttering issues that a lot of games have with this type of configuration. And if you are in a region where you have access to the newer parts for the prices they should be, buying something like an R3 3100 is cheaper and performs a lot better in gaming, uh, the 3300X especially if you can find it. So a single socket board would make the most sense. And the best path to a cheap gaming PC is buying modern low-end parts instead, at least versus this thing. So scrounging for surplus server parts on mega retail sites has lost some of its charm over the years because of the price accessibility of modern gaming targeted hardware. That said, scrounging for stuff is a lot more fun, and there may be an upside yet, so on with the review. The board is perfectly capable of running with only one CPU installed in the primary socket, but only the four RAM slots associated with that CPU will be enabled, while the PCIe slots are unaffected. The board has LEDs next to each memory slot to show which ones are currently detected and in use. Both 8-pin CPU power connectors are required, even if only one CPU is installed. The board only claims compatibility with V3 and V4 Xeons, and we had no luck booting with a Haswell E i7-5930K and so our experimentation ended there, since the core i-series CPUs aren't dual socket compatible anyway, which defeats the whole purpose of the board. The board proudly proclaims in multiple locations on the packaging and product pages that it is, quote, a true eight-channel mother, mother board. There's no, there's no A. Running a single CPU with four sticks of memory installed in the slots associated with that socket does allow the system to run in quad channel. But, try as we might, we couldn't get Hardware Info or CPU-Z to report more than that with two CPUs and a full set of memory. It's hard to prove a negative. We tried a lot of BIOS options, maybe we missed one, or maybe the number of memory channels isn't reported correctly on dual socket boards, maybe it requires a V4 Broadwell Xeon, or one of many other possibilities. In any case though, all of our tasks were run in quad channel as reported by software. In addition, no combination of BIOS tweaking or changes could persuade our memory to run higher than 2133 MHz, uh, which is the Intel specified maximum supported frequency for these CPUs. This isn't particularly surprising, uh, but it does appear to be a hard limit at least with these, and so the maximum achievable speed of memory on this board should be probably about 2400 MHz if you get a Broadwell CPU in it that supports that speed. The BIOS does have a custom memory multiplier setting, but it had no effect on either the 3200 MHz Trident Z memory that we used for testing, or some of the 2400 MHz ECC memory that we have lying around as well. The settings for memory timings did work, so you can do some tuning. It's just you're limited on frequency. Unfortunately though, in terms of tweaking and overclocking, these Xeons are locked. You can't officially overclock them, 
Uh, but this type of hardware has attracted a thriving community of modders and hackers, some of whom have discovered a way to force max turbo clocks uh, across all threads on the Xeons. And we're using one of those mods today. Unmodified, CPU-Z reports that the system we built runs with a 33x multiplier with one or two cores active, 31x with three active, 30x with four active, and 29x for anything more than that, and that's per socket. That means that in most workloads, the CPUs will clamp down to 2.9 gigahertz across all 24 cores and 48 threads and stay there. This tweak promises to raise that peak multiplier to 33x across all cores at all times for a potential 400 megahertz boost in multi-threaded workloads. However, it's not currently possible to remove the 120 watt TDP limit per CPU, which they easily hit at stock voltages. Many modders also apply tiny undervolts, which are just enough to allow the CPUs to boost higher without hitting TDP while remaining stable. There are two primary ways to apply the mod. BIOS modding, which is permanent, or EFI modding, which can break with Windows updates. Following detailed step-by-step -step instructions from modder MIY const, or however, sorry, we don't know how to say that name, we first attempted BIOS modding, which failed due to some hardware variation that at least one other commenter experienced. Their solution was to compile their own driver. Ours was a much easier route, switching to the EFI mod, which would only work for a single socket. My Const's blog and YouTube channel are excellent resources for anyone buying or modding boards just like this one. For all of our effort, we were rewarded with an all-core turbo of 3.3 gigahertz on a single CPU and a minus 21 millivolt offset, while the other CPU remains completely stock. That's still a significant change though, so we continued with testing. And note also that we only ran these tests for a limited amount of time. Mileage may vary, and we don't know how well the board hardware will stand up to this type of boosted clock over time. In particular, the stock VRM heat sinks seem undersized and have very little surface area. Again, this isn't the best gaming system in price to performance terms. In fact, it's not a good gaming system at all, but we're going to run a couple of extra gaming tests anyway with that modified clock, and we'll do that just with some 1080p results, and then we'll move on to the workstation benchmarks. The clock tweaks raised the average FPS for the Three Kingdoms battle benchmark from 101 to 108. That's a decent 7% uplift for CPUs that can't really be overclocked. That higher number ties it with the i3-10100, although the 1% and 0.1% lows are still much worse with the Xeons. We've made the decision to test low-end CPUs, like the 10100, with memory clocked to 2666 MHz. Since that's the maximum supported speed on motherboards that budget Intel CPUs can be paired with, we figured it was a fair representation of how they'd realistically be matched. We do have results for the 10100 with memory clocked to the usual speed of 3200 though for testing, and average FPS there is significantly higher at 119. We mentioned this because memory speed was locked to 2133 on the Dual X99 board, which is a significant performance limitation in many of the games we test. As for the relevant 12 core comparison, the 3900X ran 137 FPS average with the lows at 92 and 84. Still significantly better, as you'd expect, of a much newer architecture and single socket configuration. The Division 2 had a full 20% increase in average FPS with the increased turbo clocks. As a general rule, the more multi-threaded the game, the more it should benefit from the increase. Since the original maximum limited core boost was already 33x, we see that multi-threaded advantage show up in games that are loaded, more than just a couple of cores. The new average of 137 FPS still comes nowhere close to the 3600, which is still a full 34% beyond the boosted Xeons. As always, the 1% and 0.1% lows with the Xeons are abysmal. The 3900 XT stock, just for reference, runs about 190 FPS average, showing that 12 cores and 24 threads can work pretty well in this game. One of the few games where the Xeons performed well was Assassin's Creed, where not only did the turbo changes increase performance by 19% to 110.3 FPS average, but also the 1% and 0.1% lows weren't unusually bad for the performance level shown by the average. That puts them close behind the stock 3600's 114 FPS average for once, and actually ahead of the 10400. Assassin's Creed is absolutely the exception to the rule, as we saw hitching in all of the other games we tested, but not here. 
We typically introduce F1 2019 by remarking that it's able to run at a high frame rate on almost any CPU from the past decade. And that's true of the Xeons as well. But we're back to the problem of frame time spikes with both stock and boosted frequencies averaging just 22 FPS from their 0.1% lows. The overall frame rate average increased 17% from 146 FPS to 171 FPS with the boost, but the stock 3600 and 10400 both averaged above 200 FPS in this test. Time to move on to some production workloads. Back to Blender, the logo render test required almost 12 minutes to complete on the dual X99 system, with the 3900X not far ahead at 11.4 minutes. That's again far better than the 3600 at 23 minutes and the 10400 at nearly half an hour, which at the time we originally bought these CPUs were the price equivalents. But it's not great when compared to a half core count CPU from the modern era, like the 3900X. Even still, Blender remains the ideal task for these CPUs because it scales closely with core count and we won't see scaling this clean in most other tasks, except for code compile at the end. Given the board layout, Adobe Premiere is one of the more potentially realistic workloads for this system. Rendering our 1080p task file took 4.4 minutes on the Xeons, regardless of tweaks. Their advantage over the 3600 is less dramatic here, as completion time stops scaling with thread count after a certain point. But it's still 10% faster. The stock 3600 takes 4.9 minutes to complete the same task, and the 10400 lagged further behind at 5.5 minutes. The 3900X posted a time reduction of 22% as compared to the dual Xeons, and so still shows an advantage. Moving to our 4K render file, the turbo tweak showed more of an improvement, with a noteworthy 13% reduction from 12.8 minutes down to 11.1, while the 3600 took 14.3. One of the 3600's strongest advantages over the Xeons is that it's overclockable, but even with a 4.3 GHz all-core overclock, the 3600 took 13.6 minutes to complete the render. For less than $400 combined, there are definitely worse CPU and board options for budget production builds. The 3900X, though, for baseline reference, required 8.9 minutes, so technically it's, yes, more expensive as just the CPU, but Depending on how much you can stretch the budget, there are some very real, serious gains to be had with a modern 3900X and a modern motherboard, even though it would run you maybe $150, $200 more expensive. The Xeons did actually really well in the Chromium code compile test, but gained negligible performance from the Turbo Boost upgrade, with a minimum completion time of 63 minutes. The 3600 required 118 minutes to finish the test, allowing the dual Xeons a lead of 46% time reduced. The 3900X is about tied in this test at half the cores, but higher total cost, and to be fair, the Xeons were technically ahead of it in performance. Finally, we're looking at power testing as measured at the EPS 12 volt cables, not at the wall. So this is the CPU, or the dual CPU in this case, power consumption. The 253 watt stock power consumption in Blender is far more power than the modern stock CPUs on the chart, including ones that are capable of easily outperforming these in the workstation tasks, like in these Threadripper CPUs, where even the stock 3990X didn't draw more than 222 watts in our testing. Electricity isn't free, and over a long enough period, that hidden cost can potentially eat into the savings that buying old hardware could potentially deliver. Increasing all-core turbo on a single CPU didn't change the long-term power consumption in Blender, but if we switch over to Cinebench, we see that the short-term numbers measured in Cinebench R20 jumped to over 290 watts. Successfully boosting the CPU, the second one, would have put us well over 300 watts, a number we haven't seen in this batch of CPU tests outside of high overclocks, like on the 10900K. As we approach the conclusion, it's worth going over a couple of useful features that aren't really shown in the benchmarks. Useful feature number one for the two-way is the manual. It's almost entirely in Chinese, and it's only 11 pages long, but it has a sincerely useful breakdown of the board components and a brief overview of the BIOS menu that you can figure out just by looking at the images. The board itself still has the look of something that was assembled with leftover server hardware and generic heat sinks, but Jinsha has put some effort into making this a legitimate consumer product. It seems like Huananzhi has stepped up their game as well, since last time we tested their DualSocket X79 board, it didn't even have a website for the company, and now they do. It's got product listings, drivers, and yes, actual BIOS firmware downloads. In general, these brand names seem to have become a lot more real over the past couple of years. 
to the extent that users might not have to browse Russian overclocking forums to get any information on the boards. The biggest letdowns of this board almost all resulted from space limitations. The board is exactly 12 inches square, which is a standard ATX height, but somewhere in the no man's land between SSI CEB and EEB for width. The two big LGA 2011-3 sockets and their associated VRM heatsinks take up maybe a quarter of the surface area of the board, leaving little room for anything else. Each socket only has four memory slots paired with it, a lot for a consumer board, but nowhere near the amount that two Xeons could potentially support. The E5 2678V3 doesn't have an ARC page, but the similar 2680 is listed as supporting up to 768 gigabytes of memory across four channels. There's only one full length PCIe by 16 slot, and this is also the only PCIe slot marked CPU1, the primary CPU. The three by one slots are marked PCH, Considering that the E5 2678V3s that we used for testing have 40 PCIe lanes each, that's a shame. But there's at least some honesty in the board markings. The CPU sockets are marked CPU1 and CPU2 as well, which had been a problem with the dual X79 board previously. The X4 NVMe slot is real, at least according to hardware info, and with a drive installed in this slot, the GPU continued to operate at PCIe 3.0 by 16 bandwidth. The SATA ports all detected as 6 gigabits per second, but the blue and the black ones are attached to different SATA controllers. Another unique feature of the Jin Sha board is the onboard GPU and the single VGA out. Xeons don't have IGPs, so this is an extremely useful feature, but not for gaming. Setting the VGA jumper on the board and toggling some BIOS options allowed us to successfully boot into Windows 10 using the onboard GPU. This is detected as an A-speed technology AST2400 with very little other information offered. A-speed, as far as we can tell, is a fabulous design company. Hardware Info describes it as a PCI device with 64 megabytes of DDR memory. And using the default Windows Display Driver gave us a maximum supported resolution of 1152 by 864 at 64 hertz. A-Speed's spec sheet for the AST2400 explains that it's an SOC that contains a 400 megahertz ARM processor and a 2D video adapter that supports resolutions up to 1920 by 1200 at 60 hertz. Some of the other features listed, like video over IP and USB over IP, may be attractive to someone setting up a home server or a NAS, especially given how many SATA ports the board has. Using the AST2400 as the primary display adapter allows the single full-length PCIe slot to be used for something other than a GPU, opening up more possibilities for workstation applications that don't require a GPU. So this board's been a lot of fun to just play around with. The A-speed SoC, the wide CPU compatibility, the fact that NVMe is present, uh, and theoretical 8-channel memory can work. It's just, it's not a gaming mother board, B-O-R-D. Uh, there's no pair of Xeons that will ever change that. And new CPUs are just plain better for the purpose of gaming. And you can get them cheaper, a lot cheaper, by the way, than this combo anyway, even though this one is quite cheap. Even on AliExpress, there are cheaper boards available than this one too. And they are dual socket X99. This one was just the most interesting to us because of the weird assortment of features like having onboard video, which is potentially useful for some other deployment because then you can use your PCIe slot for something else. Of course, a single slot board with more PCIe lane, or slots rather, not lanes, but uh, slots may be more useful to you if you're doing a gaming-ish targeted build or one that's at least supposed to play a little bit better with games while handling your workstation tasks. But then you cut out half of the expandability for those workstation tasks. So there are places you could use something like this, and depending on the pricing of modern CPUs in your region, maybe it makes more sense to go with a board and CPU combo like this one. But it's just it was hard for us to find a place we'd actually recommend this. Uh, the board itself is actually fine, and there's a ton of modding support out there for it by a third-party community. So there is a lot of fun in playing around with it, but it's kind of an expensive toy. Because after we were done playing around with like BIOS and everything else, we couldn't find a great deployment for it where it made more sense than modern stuff. To be fair though, this is technically cheaper than a 3900X and more cores and threads. It's just that they're older and they haven't aged quite as well as, uh, as, as it used to, given the modern 
brush that we're painting with Ryzen and modern Intel. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. We'll see you all next time.